Well, good evening, everyone. And uh, um, let me just start by addressing the elephant in the room. So, yes, uh, I am Lee Robinson's son. And so when uh, Justin phoned me a few uh, months ago, possibly, or WhatsApped me to try and ease me in, um, he said, uh, would you preach on the 20th of October? And I was like, are you, you got to be kidding me. I'd never want to stand in the this pulpit where my dad stood for 14 years, um, giving amazing sermons. He's my favorite preacher in the world. Um, I'm definitely not going to be doing that, but uh, after much uh, coercion, uh, Justin said, uh, John, I just uh, tell some stories. And uh, so I think I can tell some stories, and that's what I'm going to do tonight. And uh, I'm going to start uh, with telling you a little bit about, uh, about my story. I started uh, life in the, in the corporate world. I worked for uh, Dimension Data and, and IBM. And uh, I always knew that uh, probably the corporate world wasn't where I was going to stay, and I felt that God had uh, something else uh, planned for me. And uh, when the stock market crashed in 2001, I took the opportunity, my wife and I took the opportunity to quit our jobs, uh, uh, resign, pack up everything into a couple of boxes, and uh, take a year off to go and travel. Uh, and in that time, we, uh, uh, we did a 27,000 kilometer road trip through the US and Canada. We backpacked through Europe, and uh, the beginning and end of the year, we spent uh, in Canada with, uh, with my mom and dad. And uh, mom and dad actually introduced me to a man by the name of Ugo Ciro, and uh, he had a uh, company in coffee, a fair trade coffee company, and uh, this was my first exposure to fair trade at all, and I just, I loved the concept, I loved the fact that uh, you could have a business in, uh, in something you loved, and uh, I've always loved coffee, my grandmother introduced me to coffee when I was about 13 years old, she said, Jonathan, if you can have coffee without sugar, you will taste the aromas and flavors, and life will be transformed um, for you, and it obviously has been, um, and uh, yeah, so she introduced me to coffee, and uh, I was excited to be able to, the thought of, of merging these two aspects, um, my love for coffee with the ability to make a difference in the lives of small-scale coffee farmers. And uh, so at the end of that uh, year, um, Nikki and I decided to come back to South Africa. And it was interesting because uh, when we headed out on our year of travel, we'd actually put all our stuff in these containers, and, uh, um, and we really had the thought that uh, if that we would really travel with quite open eyes and uh, potentially relocate somewhere else in the world. And at the end of that year, we just felt that, uh, that where we, God had placed us in South Africa, um, this is where he has us. Um, this is where our hearts are, and this is where he wants us to be and where he wants us to have influence. And so we came back to South Africa super excited uh, to be part of, uh, of this country and this continent that we love. Um, and uh, when I got back, I didn't feel it was quite the right time yet to, to start being there. And so I spent uh, uh, two years raising funds for children orphaned or affected by AIDS with an organization called Starfish. And then uh, took the plunge and started being there in my, in my garage. Uh, and uh, fast forward 14 years, uh, we have two roasting locations in Johannesburg and a cafe in Cape Town and uh, have the great joy and privilege of roasting and supplying some of the finest coffee in the world from countries from Ethiopia, Kenya, Tanzania, Rwanda, Burundi and the DRC. We work with small-scale coffee farmers and are able to roast that coffee and supply it to corporates and lodges and uh, um, some retail. You may have seen it on the shelves of Diskim and Pick and Pay and others. And uh, we have a lot of fun while we do that as well. I believe that uh, work, should, work should be fun and we certainly, we certainly have a lot of fun in what we do. But really at the heart of our business and the reason that being there exists is the direct fair trade aspect. Um, and uh, fair trade is quite an uh, easy concept to understand, really, because it's just those two words of trading fairly. Um, and uh, I think it's really the, the way that God has designed work to be. I think it's the way that work should be. It should be about trading, trading fairly with one another. Um, and uh, I remember... Um, a few uh, months into, into our business, or probably a few months, into, a few years into our business, um, I probably needed some money. And uh, I sat down with a potential investor and I presented our, our company and our finances and everything. And he said, oh, Jonathan, I really like it. I like what you're doing. Um, love the coffee, naturally. And, uh, and then he said, uh, but you have a small problem here. The fact is, is that uh, you 
pay the farmers too much for, the, for, your, for your coffee, and uh, if you paid them less, um, all of that would drop out to the bottom, um, and you'd have a far more profitable business. Um, and at which point I said, well, unfortunately, you won't be an investor for us because you don't understand why we're in business. And um, I think uh, what we've got in business sometimes is we've got, we've got things a little bit mixed up and a bit messed up. Um, I don't think that uh, this is necessarily how God designed business and how he wanted us to conduct ourselves. Um, I think uh, in business we're so often chasing those extraordinary returns, those uh, shareholder profits. Um, and uh, when, you, when you pursue those above everything else, you tend to do that at the expense of people and the expense of the planet which God has given us to, to look after. Um, I think that... Uh, one of the best ways for me to, uh, to give you a, an idea of what fair trade means in the lives of our farmers is to tell you a bit of a story. Uh, it's a story of uh, my favorite farmer, Agnes. We, should, we maybe shouldn't have favorites, but uh, I have a favorite. Uh, and uh, Agnes I met in Kenya in 2007 when we first started. And I sat with Agnes uh, under some trees in the rural part of Kenya, and it's just a little town of Rithagati on the slopes of the beautiful Mount Kenya, magic volcanic soils, perfect for growing grey coffee. Um, I sat with uh, Agnes and we, we had a chat and we connected really well, and uh, during, the, during our conversation it, uh, it came out that Agnes has two kids, um, Anne and Telvin, and at that time Anne was in school and uh, Telvin was not in school. And naturally, um, like would probably happen to all of you here, uh, when you'd heard this, you would naturally go to your wallet and say, how can I solve this problem? Um, I can pay for school fees so that Telvin can go to school. And at that point, I just sort of paused and uh, sort of rolled back a bit um, and thought, you know, why am, I, why am I here? Why does being there exist? What's our, um, I'm here to trade fairly with Agnes. Um, and so I made uh, that decision that, uh, that we would buy Agnes's coffee. Uh, she produces the finest coffee in the world. Maybe not in the world, but she produces exceptional, exceptional coffee. Um, and she deserves to get a great, great price for that coffee. Um, it's not about charity. It's not about me handing out um, uh, money unduly to Agnes. She produces great coffee. She deserves to be paid fairly. Um, and uh, that's what we've done with Agnes for the last 12 years. Um, we've worked with the cooperative that she's part of um, and have paid them great prices for incredibly great coffee. And... Uh, it's been a great journey to watch Agnes over the last 12 years. You know, she was uh, through our premiums and through um, fair payment, she's been able to educate both of her children. She's uh, been able to get involved in agronomy programs, which was particularly exciting. She started uh, learning better farming techniques, and uh, as a result of that, her yields increased. So she went from two kilos a tree to five kilos a tree to eight kilos a tree, um, and that had a significant impact in her, in her income. And uh, over the years, I've visited Agnes and, uh, um, and seen, uh, the, seen the changes as, uh, as she's grown. But uh, last year in June, um, Chandra, who comes to this church as well, uh, who works with me, uh, her and I went and spent some time uh, visiting Kenya and sat in Agnes's, uh, Agnes's house. The first time I sat with Agnes and had a cup of tea, she was in a little mud hut. Uh, this time when I sat down with Agnes, she, was in a, she has a brick home with, um, with tin roof and gutters. I feel gutters are significant. Um, they prevent that rain coming over the front door. Um, she had gutters. Uh, we sat inside and, uh, on her couch, and uh, she pre presented us with an incredible meal. Uh, in the background, she had a TV on with a Batman sort of, uh, Batman sort of movie playing, which I think was just there for the benefit of demonstrating that the TV worked because she had been able to put electricity into her own home, which is amazing. Uh, while we sat there, the vet arrived to do an artificial insemination um, of, uh, of one of her cows. And uh, when we'd finished uh, eating, we sat on that couch and uh, she took out her iPhone and we scrolled through some pictures of previous visits I've had with Agnes over the years. And I sat back and uh, got a little emotional as I thought about the transformation that has happened um, in Agnes's life. Um, I'd like to say that it was all as a result of coffee um, and the fair trading that uh, we've done with Agnes, but it's not really. It's, we've played a small part. Agnes is an amazing woman who has got 
got fire and determination and uh, she's got out there and made it happen. But uh, um, fair trade has enabled that. And I think that um, that's what uh, God had in mind in Isaiah 58 when he said for us to break those chains of injustice, to stop exploitation in the workplace and to give people some margin in order to be able to, to move and change and to, to grow in their own lives. If you ask um, any of uh, the Been There team um, what our vision statement is at Been There, um, everyone knows it. They will tell you it's to make a sustainable difference in the lives of African coffee farmers through direct fair trade. And it used to end there. Um, and uh, a few years uh, into probably the life of Been There, uh, the team came and we probably had a meeting or we in chatting, they came to me and said, Jonathan, I think we're missing something in our vision statement. What about us? Um, we're doing great work with, um, with farmers and paying premiums, and we're seeing great change, but, uh, but what about us that been there? I think we need to be in that vision statement. And uh, they were right. Um, and so after some uh, consultation and decisions, we, we decided to modify our vision statement to say, and provide meaningful employment in South Africa. Um, and... Uh, what does meaningful employment mean? Um, I think it has sort of two aspects. I think it has the aspect of being paid fairly, uh, and I think it has the aspect of being known, being understood, being loved, being appreciated. I think those two pieces come together in meaningful employment. And uh, I've been uh, really helped in this journey by two two great friends. Um, one is uh, Nigel Branken, who stood on this uh, stage at, uh, a few years ago and talked about living wage. Um, and uh, if you were here that uh, day, um, that was a pretty hard-hitting um, sermon. And uh, Nikki and I went away from that and realized that we needed to make some changes in our own lives with our own domestic worker and our own uh, gardener. Um, how are we paying them? Are we paying them a living wage? Uh, and then we needed to take that and into into being there and to say, you know, are we paying people a living wage? Um, I would have always told you beforehand that I uh, prided to myself in wanting to be the best payers. You know, I would do research to our competitors saying, you know, are we the, uh, in the coffee industry, do we pay the best in our industry? And I could have told you that we definitely did. Um, and, uh, but as I was confronted with, um, with what living wage is about, I realized that it's, uh, it's oftentimes the people at the bottom end, uh, the people who just come into your organization to start, um, the cleaners, the security, um, sometimes the, you know, your, the domestic workers, the, someone doing a gardening, um, who, who we oftentimes neglect. And uh, that those are, the, those are the ones that, uh, that miss out. Those are the ones that are, are exploited. And, um, we had to make some changes, um, and that was at the time I wondered, you know, uh, would we be able to financially afford it? Um, we made some of these changes, and God has honored that. Um, God came through. And um, I think at the moment, uh, if you look at our minimum wage in our country, it's sitting at 20 rand an hour, which equates to 4,000 rand a month. Um, that may be a minimum wage, but it's not a living wage. Uh, we uh, had decided at, uh, at being there that nobody should come through the doors and start in our organization for less than 6,000 rand a month. Um, we need to be able to give people some margin. We need to be able to give people the opportunity um, to, to break those cycles of poverty, to be able to cover those basic needs, to be able to do some saving and to be able to, um, and we are responsible to break those chains of injustice and seek to stop exploitation in the workplace. So the other aspect uh, that I was challenged on is, um, um, is around uh, understanding and getting to know each other's stories. And uh, my friend uh, Garth Jaffet launched uh, the, uh, runs a Heartlines organization and uh, launched that uh, movie, which you've probably all seen, Beyond the River. We as a Been There team went to, go and, went to go and see it, and afterwards we spent uh, some time just really unpacking um, what this meant and uh, trying to get to know each other a bit better, trying to break down some of these racial barriers even in our own organization, um, trying to understand each other's stories. And uh, I'll never forget sitting with uh, one of my staff members during the session. And um, 
hearing that he had lost both of his parents and that he has no siblings and that he would oftentimes, he was tolerated uh, on the property of his aunt and he lived in a little shack on this property and he would, he said to me, he would often go to bed at night um, hearing the family inside eating while he had nothing to eat. And um, hearing that story um, has forever changed the way I see him. Um, there are times when I have wanted to kill this guy, you know. Um, he, is, uh, he has provided me much frustration at times. And uh, he is uh, a little bit uh, late and um, he's a little bit unreliable. And yet, hearing his story, understanding where he's come from, has afforded me way more grace to be extended to him in his life than law. We're probably a little weighted to the grace side of being there than the law side, but I'm all right with that. Um, and uh, I guess that as I've looked at these two aspects of our, of, of our company and the, the fair trade paying farmer side and then the getting to know people understanding their stories and paying people really well. I'd say that uh, the second part is quite a lot harder. Um, I feel it's a little bit like mission sometimes. It's, uh, it's quite a lot easier to reach into your pocket and um, hand out uh, money for uh, missions or even go on a missions trip. But uh, making some of those changes in, uh, in our day-to-day -day lives, so reaching out day in and day out, getting to know people's stories of those around us, um, paying our domestic workers and gardeners and having difficult conversations with, uh, with our employees um, and our employers um, when, when people aren't paid well. That, that is really tough. As I would, uh, as I'm going to conclude, I'd like to tell you one last story. It, uh, I've been quite influenced over the last two years by an author called Bob Goff. And uh, if... Um, you're anywhere connected to my circle, you've probably got a book. Um, I bought 38 copies, and I accidentally bought 10 copies of the study guide as well. Um, and I've handed them out to, uh, to friends and family and quite a lot of strangers as well. And uh, yeah, it's just, uh, he's an incredible author, um, and uh, he writes this book called Love Does, and his second book is Everybody Always. And really the, the premise of Love Does is that we spend, uh, love is not about just planning stuff. Um, love is not about thinking about stuff. Love is about doing. And his second book is about loving and loving those who are not lovely um, and uh, loving our enemies. And uh, I guess as I, as I read that book, I thought to myself, you know, who, is the, who are those people that I don't like, you know? Um, who, do, who do I not like? And uh, honestly, it was no one in this room, so you're all safe. Um, but four guys immediately came to mind, and they are the car guards at 44 Stanley. <laughs> and um, I've had a bit of a difficult time with the car guards at 44 Stanley, and the reason is, is that, um, you know, firstly, I don't park my car in the street. I park it in a sort of a separate parking. So I... Uh, they aren't really guarding my car. I sort of run across the street into, into the, uh, my office and I get harassed along the way. Um, and, you know, over the years, uh, you know, I've sort of b built up a little bit of negativity, a bit of resistance toward them. And then it's sort of a few years ago, um, I did park my car out in the street. And uh, when I came out, my car um, wasn't there. Uh, and then um, they still asked for a tip, which... <laughs> I felt it was a little bit offside. Um, you know, I think that uh, I think it's fair that if you um, provide a service, that you get reward, and uh, the service of my car being there had not sort of materialised. Um, and so I said, guys, you know, really, car not here, no tip. Um, anyway, um, I had to borrow my sister's car, and uh, a week later, that was stolen. And so I guess uh, from the same spot. And so I guess I sort of built up this real negativity towards them, and. You know, God just, in that moment when I said, you know, God, uh, um, who do I need to love, who I don't love? Those are the four guys that came to mind. And God, like God was just saying, Jono, 
you need to love those guys. And so I um, went and drew some money, and it was around Christmas time, and uh, I went and uh, sat down with each of them individually, uh, Alfred, Charles, Thomas, and Jabu. And uh, I apologized to them. I said, I'm really sorry, guys. I've uh, come across the road, uh, tried to avoid you, um, tried to get into my office. I don't even know your names. Um, I want to know your names, and I'm going to greet you from now on. And uh, from today on, this is going to stop. I gave them the 200 bucks, which uh, was uh, for, for Christmas, which also helped, I think, to smooth things over. Um, and uh, it was amazing the transformation that happened in my own life. You know, I'm sure it's n not nearly as uh, transformative in their lives, but when I get out the car now and run across the street, um, I know that uh, Charles is on the right as I come through the gate. Um, I know Alfred is on the left. Um, I know Jabu's outside our gate, and I know Thomas, who's a head of a hustler, is sort of lurking anywhere in the street at any time. <laughs> Um, and uh, the other day, Thomas came to me and said, uh, Jonathan, I need to borrow some money because uh, I was, I'm a, wanting to start my own building business. Um, so I've loaned him some money to get registered. Uh, and then just, uh, just last week, Thomas came to me and said, Jonathan, I've got my first meeting and I was wondering, um, could I have it at the roastery and would you mind sponsoring the coffee? And I said, uh, Thomas, that would be absolutely magic. So, Jesus in the real world. Um, one thing is for sure is that the real world needs Jesus. And those of us who uh, have a relationship with him um, need, need to take him beyond these safe walls. Um, we need to stop just thinking and planning, but just get out there and, and do. Um, we need to... Stop stalking Jesus. I think we spend uh, way too much time stalking him, uh, learning about him and uh, studying him. And I think we need to do less stalking and, and more doing. So my challenge to you is uh, roll down your window, open the door, start to get to know people and their stories. Maybe go home today and have some difficult conversations uh, that are needed to have with, um, with staff or um, domestic workers, um, gardeners, um, or maybe employers. In uh, Isaiah 58, I love the way the message puts it. I think it's because I can understand it well. This is the kind of fast day I'm after, to break the chains of injustice. Get rid of exploitation in the workplace, free the oppressed, cancel debts. What I'm interested in seeing you doing is sharing your food with the hungry, inviting the homeless poor into your homes, putting clothes on the shivering ill-clad, being available to your own families. Do this and the lights will turn on and your lives will turn around at once. Your righteousness will pave your way. The God of glory will secure your passage. Then when you pray, God will answer. You'll call out for help and I'll say, here I am. Man, I want the lights to turn on. And when I call out, I want him to say, here I am.